if you believe the cosmos is all that ever was or is or ever will be, right. like Carl Sagan said, there's no reason for those laws of physics to change. Okay, so if conservation of energy is true now, it presumably should have always been true. Mm -hmm. um, the only way for that to not be the case is if there's someone outside the universe who can invoke those rules. Okay. And, and we have that in a biblical worldview, but we don't have it in a secular worldview. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Creation Podcast, a show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. A huge thank you to all of our viewers and listeners for tuning in. I'm your host, Ivana, and my guest today is Dr. Jake Hebert, ICR research scientist and physicist. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Dr. Hebert, we're going to talk about some of the most foundational laws of our universe, the laws of physics. I'm sure you're familiar right. with those. Yes. Well, we can't cover all of them in this limited time. They go into depth. But uh, let's start with the first law of thermodynamics. It's also called the law of the conservation of energy. So can you explain how that law works? Uh, yeah. The law of conservation of energy just says that uh, the energy in the universe can maybe change form, okay? okay? You know, maybe convert it from, say, what we call kinetic energy, energy of motion, mm -hmm. to energy of position or vice versa. Uh, but the total energy in the universe stays constant. That's, that's really all it says. Okay. And um, that's really one of the most fundamental uh, laws of physics. Um, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, there's an interesting story behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the scientists who did a lot to help our understanding about energy and conservation of energy was James Joule. And uh, it was interesting because he, he was actually, he concluded that energy had to be conserved because of his theology. He said only okay. God mm -hmm. can create or destroy. Therefore, right. any theory that requires the, the creation or annihilation of energy, he used the word force, but we today we would say energy. Mm -hmm. He says it has to be wrong. Well, he was right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> energy is conserved, and yeah. and if it weren't for his experiments, I don't know. We might not even know about conservation of energy today. Right. Uh, so that's a big deal, and it's it's an interesting way that um, good theology right. is a good foundation for good science. Yeah, that's yeah. excellent. Thank you for sharing sure. that. All right. So this law does it make sense within a an evolutionary worldview? Uh, not really, because I think at mm -hmm. some point you're going to, you have to, uh, well, I, I don't know. It depends. It depends on whether how okay. badly they're trying to dodge the implications. Okay? <laughs> like if you got, if you have a guy who says that the universe is eternal, uh, maybe he could argue that the energy's always existed, but it's in, been in some different form. But you know what? Now that I think about it, I don't, I don't think it makes sense even for those guys, because mm -hmm. people who try to argue that the universe is eternal are claiming that energy is still being created, but in very small quantities, okay. too small to observe. So it's like, well, you don't really have any evidence for that. Um, it, for these people like um, Lawrence Krauss, who try to argue that the universe came from nothing, that's a big violation of conservation of energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the only way that really makes sense if you, is if you're willing to acknowledge that there's someone outside of physics who can do that. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's not willing to do that. Now, they cheat a little bit. They claim there's a loophole oh. in conservation of energy called the energy time uncertainty principle, okay. which they say that it allows for conservation of energy to be violated for very short times. And so, you know, so, so supposedly, you know, you could have a universe pop into existence out of nothing as long as the energy starts out really small. Mm -hmm. uh, However, that's a very dubious in interpretation of that rule. And I've, I, you know, I'll admit particle physics is not my area of expertise, but <laughs> I've got neither. some books Safe by place. by a quantum physicist and particle physicist who says that's just wrong. That's just flat right. out wrong. Right. In fact, he even says if some, when a physicist, physicist invokes that uncertainty principle, you need to keep your hands on your wallet. <laughs> because he's probably trying to pull a fast one on you. Uh -huh. So I, you know, I think conservation of energy makes a lot more sense in a biblical worldview than in a secular one. Because 
they're going to have to try to get around it one way or another. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's more blatant than at mm -hmm. other times, but they're going to try to get around it. Okay. So you said that this might make more sense in a biblical worldview. Sure. Can you explain why that is? Well, again, uh, they, okay, great question. Uh, if you're going to violate conservation of energy, um, the problem for them is that they claim the laws of physics can't be altered. Well, Again, sometimes they dodge that. Sometimes they say they really can be all. You know, you start, it's like trying to pin them down. You know, it's like trying yeah. to pin jello to the wall. They, uh, you can't really <laughs> ever tried. pin them down. Uh, but, you know, if you think, if you believe the cosmos is all that ever was or is or ever will be, right. like Carl Sagan said, there's no reason for those laws of physics to change. Okay, so if conservation of energy is true now, it presumably should have always been true. Mm -hmm. Um the only way for that to not be the case is if there's someone outside the universe who can invoke those rules. Mm -hmm. And and we have that in a biblical worldview, but we right. don't have it in a secular worldview. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, Dr. Larry Vardaman, who used to work here at ICR, he was an atmospheric scientist. He actually corresponded with Carl Sagan before he died. Sagan admitted that that was one of the problems with his worldview is where do the laws of physics come from? Right. You know, because uh, he didn't really have a good answer for that. It, it makes sense in a yeah. biblical worldview, but not in a secular worldview. Wow. In fact, why should there be any order at all? Right. Right. Why is the universe not completely chaotic? You know, I mean, I mean, if, I mean, if you're going to mm -hmm. say that things can pop into existence, why aren't things popping into right. and out of existence? Mm -hmm. You know, I might just pop out of existence <laughs> in, the, in the next five not minutes. Not yet. We're not you done. Know? <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, it, it's, it really isn't consistent for them yeah. to hold that position. Yeah, yeah. that's an excellent point. Yeah. Thank you for that. Sure. Okay, so I feel like you gave us a really good understanding of that first law, but let's move on to the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. Can you tell us what that is? Well, it basically just says that the universe is running down. It's becoming more disorderly over time. <clears throat> and another way of saying it is to say that the amount of energy that's available mm -hmm. to do useful work is decreasing. Now, the energy is still there, okay. but it's not in a form that's useful to us. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a particular problem for those who would argue that the cosmos is eternal. If you believe, you know, that the universe is essentially infinite in age, why have we not already reached a state where there's no useful energy left? Mm -hmm. You know, why, why, you know, we still got useful energy left. You know, if the universe is infinitely old, we shouldn't have any. So that at mm -hmm. least seems to imply the universe had to have a finite beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's, it's not eternal. Um, and so that, again, uh, you know, that's another issue. Uh, you know, if, if the universe is running down, it had to start from a less rundown state. Right. Okay, so who started it? Who who put it in that state? Mm -hmm. And of course, we think the answer is that God did it. Right. Um, he wound it up, so to speak, and now it's it's running down over time. Uh, so you know, they it, when you really press them on those, um, both the first and second laws are problematic for them. But if you, if, you, if you press them hard enough, they'll try to come up with some dodge. Yeah. Um, and I, you know what I think? You know, I've told you earlier um, that they, they believe there's in, infinitely many universes out there. Mm -hmm. uh, they claim that our universe is only one of zillions, and that's coming from the Big Bang. And I, I kind of, this this multiverse idea it, it sounds to me almost like it's an attempt for them to have their cake and eat it too, mm -hmm. because they want the universe to be eternal. But they know that if it is eternal, you got a problem with the second law of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. But if you were to argue that, well, it's only our universe that's finite, maybe you could go back zillions of years in the past. And so that, that multiverse maybe is really old. Of course, that doesn't work either because even they admit that it has to have a beginning somewhere. So, but it's like, it's like, it's almost, it's like they're pushing the, they're trying to push the beginning as far back as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. But I think ultimately you've got to have a beginning somewhere. Unless you want to just say the universe is eternal. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, there's problems with that. Yeah. Just The second law is a problem with that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So looking at the second law, and you've kind of touched on this, but just you know, directly address if that fits in with an evolutionary worldview. Uh, I don't think it does. I mean, it, it, it um, you know, for one thing, it's, uh, it, it should suggest the, the age of the universe 
is finite. It has to have a finite age. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it seems to fly in the face of evolutionary claims. You know, why, why is it that, um, you know, you've got uh, the universe running down, but supposedly we're becoming more evolved, better organized over right. time. Now, to be fair to them, they would argue that, uh, you know, you can maybe have small places in the universe where or order increases, but the, the, the disorder decreases okay. or increases somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, the, the doing the math there is kind of tough. Uh, you know, um, it's probably better to talk about information when you're talking about organization uh, because it's when you talk about entropy, uh, showing mathematically that the second law does not allow for things to become more complex over time, that's hard to do. And I don't know if we can make a rigorous mathematical argument for that, mm -hmm. but I still think it's probably true. Okay, I just don't know if I can prove it. Okay. Uh, but probably a better way to talk about it is to talk about the fact that you, it, evolution requires information. It requires new information to be created. Okay. And as far as we know, information only comes from an intelligence. Uh, you, you, information is not something that is produced naturally. Mm -hmm. And for evolution to be true, you've got to somehow be generating new information. And uh, it really doesn't make sense. The, the, the logical explanation is you think about the information in our DNA, the most sensible explanation is that came from a creator, a very wise, intelligent, and powerful creator. Mm. Um, so it, it, it just there's a lot of stuff about um, that just doesn't agree with the basic laws of physics. You know, it, it, Evolution, it it certainly seems to be a face value contradiction with the second law. Now, maybe you can quibble that we, we can't mm -hmm. make an airtight argument for that. Okay, it's just probably true. But, you know, you just, it certainly seems counterintuitive. It mm -hmm. seems counterintuitive that the that we would be that things beings in the universe would be coming better over time when right. when we know that everything's running down. So there's just all there's all kinds of problems. Yeah. Uh, the laws of physics really, I think, are a problem uh, for the secularist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. With that being said, how does it fit in with a biblical worldview? Well, again, uh, you know, if you've got a an understandable, intelligible universe, you've got to have a source for that in mm -hmm. th those laws. The secularist will try to tell you that the laws of physics could have created the universe. To me, that is just absolute nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, for the simple reason, you know, what is a law of physics anyway? People, people <laughs> sometimes get lost in the weeds, yeah. but all a law of physics is is a mathematical description of how the universe behaves. That's it. Mm -hmm. Descriptions don't do anything. Okay, They have no power okay. to make anything happen. They're mm -hmm. just descriptions of the way things behave. And so this idea, well, the laws of physics could have created the universe, to me, just doesn't make a lick of sense. Mm -hmm. I, to me, that's a nonsensical statement. Um, you know, all the all they are are descriptions of how uh, the universe behaves, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it behaves in an orderly way. And you know, the most logical explanation for that is because we have a creator mm -hmm. who is a god of order. And he's, he's imposed this order on the universe. He's upholding it so that it behaves in a predictable way. Now, he can still do miracles if he wants to, if he wants to intervene. But, the, you know, the laws of physics are just descriptions of how the universe normally behaves as God upholds it. That's mm -hmm. really all it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, that is great. And it's, it's funny that you say all that. And for Christians, you know, I don't have a, a heavy science background, but I have a Bible and right. I, I read it and seeing how if the universe was created by a creator, everything was perfect. Mm -hmm. And then now we're in a state after the fall and sin and all of that, you know, that's just something to me. You can see well, that. Well, yeah, but there, you do have to be a little bit careful there because a lot of, I, I, I do think the second law was in effect before mm -hmm. the fall happened. Um, you know, because, it, because the second law is also responsible for like why, Ice melts in a glass, you know, or mm -hmm. why heat flows from right. hot to cold objects. But what I think, and I think what a lot of creationists think, is that God was supernaturally mm -hmm. protecting living things from the right. detrimental effects of the second law. Uh, in other words, and we have examples of this in Scripture. When the Israelites were wandering in the desert, God supernaturally prevented their shoes from mm -hmm. wearing out. 
Apparently, he protected Joshua and Caleb and even Moses from the effects of old age because we read in Deuteronomy when Moses died, it says his natural force was not abated. And Caleb, when you read Caleb, he's talking about being in the promised land. He's 80 years old. He says, I feel like a young man. <laughs> so I think, I think we have biblical precedent that right. God can protect. He's certainly powerful enough to do it, mm -hmm. to protect living things from the detrimental effects of the second law, mm -hmm. even though the second law would have been in effect. I, I, think, I think the second law was in effect before the fall happened. Mm -hmm. But when the fall occurred, I think God just withdrew his hand. Right and allowed, allowed living things yeah. to experience the, the bad effects of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's undeniable. But thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate you sharing all of that information with us. And I know we've probably barely scratched the surface with these laws, um, but if anyone wants to know more about these laws and in future episodes, feel free to send us a message on social media. But to all of our viewers and listeners, thank you so much for joining us. You can find this podcast on YouTube and other areas where you might find your podcasts. And remember to leave us a review and a rating so that others can know more about us. And of course, subscribe for future episodes. I'm Ivana, and we'll see you next time on The Creation Podcast.